Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, January 30th. Wow, how'd that happen? <laughs> 2020. This is the weekend charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you making the effort. Seems like lately I haven't been getting around to promoting it very much, but the link does not change unless I fat finger something. So if you're in, you should be you should get a link next week and prior weeks. So I will be taking a week off in coming weeks. And I'll let you know when that is, just so we don't get burglarized. <laughs> that uh, date should be for the 30th. So the current market conditions. Now, I left this in from several months back. And I think we're still in a bull leg, but I think there's some little cracks here and there. And I'm beginning to have some concerns. Now, a day or two ago, I felt a lot better than I do now. And that's why we take things on a day by day basis longer term i still think we're in a decent bull run but again there's been a few cracks and we'll take a look at those in just one second or a few minutes i should say uh your questions on trading if you don't mind keep them to the slides just so my add does not kick in and then when we get to the live charts we, you can ask about anything you want also wait until we get the live charts to ask about individual stocks we'll be happy to take a look at your favorite picks Ideally, you want to be a trend follower. Every now and then, I have to kick somebody out who knows better. If you're new to the show, no worries. I promise not to kick you out first thing, first day here. But as you get up to speed, I might have to kick you out if you ask about a stock that is not trending. And if you don't mind, and this is for also for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time. So I'm going to continue on with this ongoing quest, and it's it's kind of taken a few tangents this week into a little bit of the opening gap reversal trading which was fantastic last week. And this week, we'll see. But I guess the week ain't over with yet, at least not today. I'm not doing so hot with that. And we'll flesh all that out in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. There's often summing up all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And that comes from my buddy, Greg Morris. So my ongoing quest, as I've been saying for several weeks, is to have the short-term trading pay for the longer-term trading. The real money, as I preach, is in the longer-term trading. And by the way, if you just trade the short-term and only the short-term, it'll work until they don't. Unfortunately, you get whacked pretty hard, and then it's going to be hard to recover from that. I'm getting whacked really hard today, but, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully some of our longer-term positions will, at least over time, pull me out of the hole. But yeah, today has been about a four or five F-bomb morning. My, there's some contractors next door building a house. They said, hey, sir, can you uh, watch your language? <laughs> I want to follow up on free rolling, which is basically you're taking those partial profits and, and then sitting tight in your positions. I also want to follow up on sitting tight in positions unless there is something to do. Do nothing unless there's something to do. And then... I want to talk about opening gap reversals or opening gap reversals free money. Well, sometimes they sure do appear to be. And then I added this, I wish, at the last minute because today I've already locked in a loss on an opening gap reversal. So I don't want to make it look like you always print money with these things. But sometimes if you pick your spots extremely carefully, you could do quite well. So speaking of ogres, having the short term trading pay for the longer term trading and again the real money is in the longer term trades you hold on to that little biotech and it runs up 50 or 100 points and even with a fairly small position that begins to add up quickly but what you have to do because you don't always catch that big move it could be a little bit elusive that occasional outlier seems like it's too far and few between but eventually you'll get one it just takes time and a tremendous amount of patience. And it's not easy. I don't want to make it look like it's easy. I actually woke up this morning and wrote a little bit about the scumbags out there. And I don't want to focus too much on that. But they're always making it look easy. And believe me, if it was that easy, they wouldn't be telling you what they're doing. They might be telling you what they're doing <laughs> and they're already in and pumping a stock to get a profit out at your expense. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. The question is, are ogres worth it? And it can be a real slippery slope. For those who don't know what that is, it's opening gap reversals. I'm going to walk you through a few here. One thing I often think about is 
people who are at least new to my methodology are probably thinking, well, this guy is, uh, he's all into these opening gap reversals, is all he does. Well, no, that's not the real bread and butter. The real bread and butter is getting a little swing trade out of a position and holding on to it longer term and making a lot of money on that second loaf. But in the meantime, especially since I'm here anyway, at least watching the open, these opening gap reversals occasionally can be worth it. And you can occasionally put a little money in your account while waiting on that big trend trade. As I said last week and weeks prior, as a trend follower, you will spend a lot of your time or most of your time less wealthy. And that's waiting for that next big trend to come along. You just kind of tread water in the meantime. Now, if, and it's a big if, but if you could pick up a few pennies here and there on these opening gap reversals, and then hopefully, I don't know, I said hope, but hopefully a little bit more than a few pennies on some of these swing trades and get your stops up to break even, so you're free rolling, which we'll take a look at the portfolio in just one second with, with the free rolling trades in there, then you're wonderfully positioned for the potential longer term moves. Now, I do want to touch upon something. I got a, I received a question yesterday at the stock chart show, and we'll flesh it out in just one second about bumping that stop to break even after the initial profit target is hit. And I'll go through this in a lot of detail. But it does beg the question on these swing trades and moving to break even and getting stopped out, is there a potential to miss the forest for the trees? And the answer is yes. But in trading, there's always a trade-off. So Carol can't hear me. Carol, turn your speakers up. Your sound is turned down. <laughs> Carol, put your hearing aids in. <laughs> no, I'm showing sound on this end, so it's uh, it's probably working. What happens is a uh, squirrel might have been moving his nuts from one location to the other and got his nuts caught in the wire. <laughs> So let's take a look at a short-term attempt at a longer-term trade. And I guess it turned out to just be an attempt. This is a little biotechnology stock. And as you know, with these pioneer trades, we're looking to get in usually within the first few weeks. But one thing that's pretty fascinating with... <laughs> Carol turned her speakers up. <laughs> okay. One thing that's fascinating with these early trend trades, these pioneer trades, or what is intended to be a pioneer trade with IPOs, is sometimes there's a longer term aspect to it, meaning that this trade could trigger on day five, okay, at the earliest. So that'd be five days in a trading. In other words, comes public on a Monday. By Friday, you could be long on the close, okay? But what's interesting is there is a longer term aspect to this. And I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Now, probably need to go in, and I used to do this a lot, I haven't done it lately, but I think it'd be a good idea for you guys to do the same thing, and maybe you can remind me when this happens. I think it'd be a good idea, especially on something that looks kind of interesting with these IPOs, or, or just all of them for that matter, by interesting enough volume to trade, maybe a little range, enough range to trade, but go in and put in a alert near brand new highs, so you'll get alerted when the stock is beginning to break out. Now, keep in mind, for those new to the methodology, I'm not a breakout trader, but IPOs, he tried to say, do have a breakout characteristic. Now, one thing I discovered is sometimes you get a big euphoria on day one, and then it dies out. And the other thing I discovered is usually the significant high or low is set during the first week of trading. So don't trade IPOs unless you close at a new high and then backing that out at what I just said about the new high, significant new high, the day one high is very significant. So if the day one high sets the high for the week, you must also close above that. Now, flesh that out in just one second. So before I'm looking to get an IPO, it must exceed what I'm going to later call here the buy line or potential buy line, I should say. And it also, that buy line is the closing high. And if the first day's high is greater than the closing high and the high for the week, the highest high for the week, then it also must be above that high, as I'm showing you here. Now, the other 
rule for this pattern, in addition to closing in a new closing high, which is also above the day one high, if the day one high again is the new high for the week, and I'll show you a good example of that in just one second, you also must have Landry light, meaning the low has to be greater, just one bar is plenty, okay? Just one bar is all we're looking for, greater than the five day simple moving average. So that suggests that you have a little bit of momentum which is also obviously further confirmed by the brand new closing high. So in this particular case, because of the new high rule, we have a close greater than the high of day one. We also have Landry light, and that close is also NCH, which means a new closing high. So you will go long on that close, and I'll walk you through the trade here in just one second. Now, I just picked a random IPO to illustrate this point. So notice on day one, it comes public, and then on day two, the high is greater than the day one high. So we throw out that has to be a brand new high rule, and then it just has to be a brand new close rule. Well, in this particular case, notice the close on day one, about 10 bucks and 80 cents, round numbers, is where you would look to get in, or that would be your buy line, so to speak. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of caveats about just buying that new closing high. But as a general statement, that's what we're looking to do. And those caveats were discussed in a lot of detail in the IPO course. I actually lost money on the IPO course because <laughs> IPOs have done so well since I came. I, I, this is a, a no BS story. I lost a lot of clients because uh, the IPOs did so well after I released the course, following some of these simple little patterns that a lot of people felt like they no longer needed me. It's like, oh, you still need me. And a lot of people dropped off the service because they were printing money in IPOs. And I can assure you that it won't always happen. So you could see day one closed, day two closed, day three closed, day four closed, and day five closed. So in this particular case, day one closed was the high close for the week. And the high for the week was set on day two. So we're not concerned with the high. So again, that's your possible buy line with quite a few caveats. That's why I have it in quotes. So getting back to the VIR, again, high was set on day one. Now those that are here, I think are pretty well versed with these IPOs and on. Your eyes are probably glazing over, but you'd be surprised at how many questions I get on such a simple little pattern. That's why I'm going through it in such painstaking detail. So in this particular case, we had the Landry light, new closing high above the day one high because day one was the high for the week, blah, 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 okay? And that's the actual trade. So we went in, at a thousand, or I went in as a thousand at 1716, right around the close. And then I flipped out 500 at 1917. You could see the first few days in the trade, and I put a little, little negative face in here, a little frowny face. And that's because I want to show you that it, it's kind of a scary trade to take. So let me explain why it's scary. Let's say you have a little pullback you're looking at today and it triggers today, well, by the end of the day, it might be up nicely. You might feel pretty good about that. At the least, you're going to get a little feedback on it. When you're buying market on close, especially into a weekend on a Friday afternoon, it's like, boy, what did I just do? Okay. And then Monday comes and you feel pretty good for early in the morning, for the morning, I should say. And then by mid-morning to midday, in the next several days, you're underwater on the trade and you're questioning your sanity. Not that they always work out, but a lot of times they will go against you. Now in this particular case, rallied up nicely. I was looking for about two points because if it dropped about two points or so, the stock would be probably in trouble back into the soup, right? No longer a breakout. And then of course the next day it took off in a huge fashion. They announced that they were working on a SARS vaccine or something. Well, it happens. It could easily gap lower the next day, right? And at least I got something off the table. And we'll pick apart these short-term versus long-term trades or short-term trades to pay for long-term trades in just one second. Now, if you were to look at this stock, and again, I know everybody here knows the rules, but for those who don't or those who are watching the recording, we did make a new closing high on that day right there, November 5th, I believe, okay? But it was not above the day one high, and the day one high was also the highest high for the opening week, okay? So 
that is not a signal. And you can see it did implode afterwards. Not that this is going to keep you out of all trouble, but it will keep you out of trouble quite often by having some of these defined rules, okay? Stuart says, how do you get a list of both US and Canadian stocks, which are IPOs? And Stuart, I haven't looked at your code too much lately, I, I, or, or I haven't looked through it all. So just be patient on that. I'm just extremely backed up with everything. But to answer your question, there are several ways that I do this, and you have access to the Q&A sessions. So go in and watch that. I use FinViz, and I set the IPO date to 90 days, and then I can set the IPO day in, date in Telechart. Well, I use a trick there. I set the minimum days to like 90 days or whatever the IPO days I'm looking for. And lately, because I have a, maintained my existing list, which I guess I could put in members resources for you guys since um, you're gold members, but you can make the same list yourself. And all I do is punch in a little formula like close minus close 10 days ago, and I look at the rejects, and I take those rejects because there's not enough data to calculate them. It's just kind of a little trick. And then that that's how I maintain the, the watch list. But yeah, look at the Q&A. I'll walk you through that there. So anyway, getting back to this, this was not a signal, okay? Now, had the second day of trading been above the first day of trading, then that would have been the new high for the week. And then this close right here would be your signal line or your buy line. And that would have been a signal because you have Landry light and you closed above. Now, there's a few of the caveats. The range was a little tight in here. I wouldn't have, I probably would not have taken it based on that tight range. And again, there's a lot of caveats that, that are going on there. Oh, and the second part of your question, Canadian stocks, I do not know, but I think the newer telechart has Canadian stocks. I will talk to the people over at Stock Charts and see what they have for Canadian stocks, if they do have them or plan to add them. And then I need to, there's there's so much going on right now, but that's that's on in the back of my mind. Not that you want to eliminate all your tools, like I, I talked about in the last Q&A, I put a picture of my tool cart on Facebook. Probably have, I don't know, a thousand tools on it, maybe. That might be a slight exaggeration and I have to go, go out and count them. I don't know if I have that much time. But it's okay to have a lot of tools that you use, but do keep things simple. And, and the tools I'm using are FinViz, Metastock, Telechart, Stock Charts, and I may have left one or two out, but I will consolidate those over time. It's kind of an ebb and flow. Just since I'm in this business, I occasionally do try some new things. I'm not trying a bunch of indicators, but I end up with different packages. And then the people over, the good people, I should say, over at Stock Charts are working hard to accommodate me. And they do have a new platform that they're beta testing, which is going to be a lot more robust than their older platform, which is kind of quick and dirty, which I like. But the new platform will be able to do a lot of these things. All right, let's talk about trading the best opening gap reversals. As I said a while back in the Facebook group, if I wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and if is the key word in that sentence, but if I wait and be super duper patient, it's almost, and I hate to use the word, I hate to make this phrase, so let me just emphasize the word almost and do some air, air quotes. It's almost like the Jimmy Rogers money in the corner trade, Jimmy Rogers and Market Wizards one. Well, the first Market Wizard says, he just waits till his money line in the corner, and all he has to do is walk over there and pick it up, paraphrasing him. In the meantime, I do nothing. Well, it seems like, as I post in the Facebook group, if I'm patient and wait 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 and wait, and wait I almost, and almost is a keyword in that sentence, I almost always make money. Being patient, obviously, is key. Now, it can be frustrating because you can get a perfect setup and lose money. Now, this wasn't exactly a perfect setup, but it was a pretty good looking setup here. You had a nice, nice, nice uptrend. You had a stock that was in the early phases of pulling back, and then it got whacked overnight pretty hard. So, in a case like this, we're looking to capture that intraday move back up in the direction of the trend. We're not looking for a day trade, although it is a day trade technically. We're looking for an intraday move. We're looking to trend follow intraday i think years ago i even bought those domains like intraday trend following and god knows if i still have them or not i have so many domains it's ridiculous somebody was trying to buy one from me a while back i said seven thousand dollars they laughed in my general direction so let's take a look at what happened to the tau intraday these are the actual trades here again kind of inspired by dalio and, and actually a few of you guys too 
I'm working to be more and more transparent as Dalio says, radical transparency. So that's on a model account, what I call a model account, because it's right around 100K or so. <laughs> it was well over 100K coming in today. I don't know where it is now. So anyway, buy was here. You want to buy, obviously, above the market. We had initial profit target up here. It missed it by a few cents. So by the time I ended up selling it, I didn't quite get that initial profit target, but I figured that I wanted to lock in some profits on the day and be free rolling, so to speak. And then I use an automated trailing stop on the remainder. And I love those automated trailing stops. I think it was like two or two and a half points. And then exit market on close. So if we add it all up, wasn't the greatest trade in the world, 192 bucks plus 362. It's 558, but that's a half a percent. If you did that every day, obviously you'd own the world, okay? And it does help to supplement your account. So here's the ACMR. This is a little bit more textbook in nature. You can see super duper nice trend, nice gap lower. If we zoom in, this is what we're trying to do or trying to accomplish. We're trying to capture that intraday move back in the direction of the trend. It's kind of a mean reversion type of trade. I say I'm not a mean reversion trader, but if you have a setup like this and an opening gap, sometimes it can be worth it. And this is what it looked like intraday. This is the Facebook post I put out. This was on Monday when the market was hit hard. So it was hard for me to give, give out a lot of parameters on that particular day. But this, this is how the trade shook out, as you can see, getting in at, about eight minutes after the open. I did make a mistake on the trade and that's factored into all this trading, but I immediately got back in. You can see that cost me about a half a point on 200 shares, so it happens. Linda Rasky's rule that she wrote about in Trading Sardines is correct mistakes immediately. My rule is similar to Linda's except that two things. I correct mistakes immediately if it's something like a trade that I'm supposed to be in. If I accidentally sell out, usually I'll go right back in or at least try to, especially in something like an opening gap reversal like this. And then if I get screwed, I get screwed, okay? I learned a lesson to be a little bit more careful in my order entry. Sometimes you get a little caught up in the markets and it's easy to just click enter. My general rule about correcting mistakes is to correct half of the mistake immediately. So if I go in and fat finger, and I seem to do this mostly in option trades, but if I go in and fat finger an options trade and I have 10 times more options than I want or intended to buy, I'll immediately flip out half of them and then I'll figure out where I stand with the remainder and look to correct that and look to trade out of it. And that's kind of dangerous. I realize that, but just make sure you do have some sort of mistake plan in place because I can guarantee you you're going to make mistakes. So here's the half for the initial profit target that was sold. And then here's the rest that was exited MOC, market on close. Now I actually don't, it all depends. If it's a big fixed stock, I'll put in a market on close, actual market on close order, which I probably need to do more of because if I've got a few positions on spread across a few accounts, then sometimes that, that close can be very hectic. But this particular case, I did it manual and you can see that there was 11 seconds left in the day. So here's the ACMR trade. That was the initial profit target there for a profit of 434. And then I let the automated trailing stop take me out of the rest. So this is what I would call the gym trade. Linda Rasky, I think used to call it the golf trade. It was a much different scenario, but same sort of concept. You put the trades on and then you get on with your life. I'm a big fan of food. I like to eat usually by around nine o'clock my time, half an hour after the open, I am starving. And if I'm stuck in front of a screen, my stomach is reminding me that it's time to eat, get away from this stupid screen, put your orders in, do whatever. And especially on these open gap reversals, if I take partial profits and the worst I could do barring a halt, and by the way, they could still halt the stock intraday and you still could be screwed, okay? We had some halts in our favor a few weeks back and that was pretty nice, but Remember, it can go both ways. Like some of these day traders that are leveraging the account several times over on one position, that's just crazy because they could easily blow up on one or two trades doing that kind of thing. But anyway, before I digress too far, I like to put in that automated trailing stop, let the chips fall where they may come in at near the close, 
and then get out of the trade. And you can see in this particular case, this little ogre trade per 100K or thereabouts made a little bit over $1,000. So that's a 1% gain in one day. Do that every day and you know in the world, compound that out on the fly in my head. I think that would probably compound out to about $400,000, but I know. So a couple of things on the intraday ogre trading. And it's like once I, I've always traded ogres, I, I haven't been very public about it until now. And I'm probably a little bit more active than I used to be. And that's probably in fault, good or bad, mostly good, I should say though, to the Facebook group, because I've been reporting more and more trades there. And I find, I find myself kind of like a, it's like a game. Like how can I find a trade, make money, and then give it to everyone before I get in, not after, not a pump and dump. And so you guys and girls can participate. But a few of you have called me up and we've talked about it at length. It is a slippery slope. And, and I don't want to call it day trading, although it is a day trade. But these intraday trades, notice that we're trying to get in as soon as we can, as soon as we get a trigger, that is, around the open. And then we're trying to hold on as long as possible. So if I'm just spending a few minutes putting the trade on and getting an automated trailing stop in and that initial profit target in, and then I know you shouldn't say hold, but hopefully that gets hit. I can go about my life. I'm not in and out all day like the little rat hitting the button for the cocaine. But you do have to be careful because you can get sucked into the market. You can start seeing things that aren't really there. In other words, if you're looking at those flickering ticks and you're getting sucked in like a moth, you could get sucked into a lot of unnecessary trades. And we're all, we all feel the pressure because we need money. We want to make money as fast as possible. But sometimes you might have to wait a long time before you get these good looking ogres. In fact, if I just waited until I got a TAL or an ACMR or a CRE going way back in time, several months, and there's a few others that escape me at the moment, usually, and usually being a key word in that sentence, I'll do pretty good. So again, these ACMRs and TALs, they don't come along every day. It might take weeks or maybe even longer for those type of trades to come along. If you're new to ogre trading, I would wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until you really think you have a really good setup and give yourself four or five of those, okay? Waiting in between, obviously. And I think you would get your feet wet and do pretty good to where you'd build confidence. Now, hopefully you don't build too much confidence, so you're swinging at everything. And that's where that slippery slope and danger does come in. Now, ideally, what I call the breakfast or the gym trade or breakfast then the gym trade or jump on my bike trade or walk away from my screens trade or whatever, kind of like Ron Popeil's Showtime Rotisserie 2000 Chicken Cooker. Again, I don't wanna be like the little rat hitting the button for the cocaine I want to work to set it and forget it via orders, hard orders, actually placed orders, and then go about my life. I do not want to sit in front of a screen all day or stand in front of a screen all day. Now, getting back to the discussion that I had with quite a few of you and the internal discussion that I have every time it doesn't work, like today, where I question my sanity and all this, is the intraday trading worthwhile. Well, this week it was, okay? So going back a week and maybe a day or two, you can see on 100K or thereabouts, <laughs> a pretty decent gain, about a two and a half percent gain. I obviously you did that every week. That's a half a million a year. I'm just kind of off the top of my head with a little compounding. And I know that's kind of fuzzy logic, fuzzy math, but it, it happens or it could happen, right? The reason that it doesn't happen like that, you print the money is because those opening gap reversals don't come along every day. And then occasionally, even if you do have a good one, you could still lose money. So maybe not this week. So on that same particular account I just showed, I already locked in a $400 loss this morning. Well, that doesn't sound like much, Dave. Well, you know, it adds up. That's 0.4% of an account. That's almost a half a percent. You lose that every day, you'd be a hurting pup really quick. So again, it can be a slippery slope, but I think it's worthwhile if I had yes or no, yes do trade them but pick your spots very 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 carefully now you have to be super duper careful because you can end up by death by a thousand not so little cuts is certainly possible and on a day like today it could add insult to injury there's been days where i've had beautiful opening gap reversals getting creamed on my portfolio i focus on getting those opening gap reversals off and by the end of the day 
I'm breaking even on the day or I'm certainly not getting creamed as bad or I have at least an extra percent or so in my account from an opening gap reversal to help mitigate some of those damages. Again, attempting to have that short-term trading pay for that longer-term trading. But you could certainly have a lot of little losses you sweep under the rug. You know, I'm kind of like, eh, 400 bucks, eh, so what, you know? Well, you do that often enough, it begins to add up. And what's $400 a day? It's $100,000 a year off the top of my head, round numbers. So remember, the real money isn't a longer-term trading. If we could figure out a way to have the short-term trading pay for it, such as taking those partial profits, and I should put the occasional opening gap reversal. It's amazing, just as I talk about opening gap reversals, not so much lately because we've been talking it out with a lot of you guys, but like early on, when I sort of mentioned an opening gap reversal in Facebook, it seems like there were a few of you guys that were going after every little tiny thing. And my post became, boy, that's a little tiny gap. I don't think that's worthwhile. So again, you have to really wait for it, wait for those really good trades. So if we can figure out a way for the short-term trading to pay for the longer-term trading, I think we don't in the world. And I did this slide a couple of days ago, actually yesterday for stockcharts.com, and I made sure I put in here results not typical, kind of like the, the diet industry, you know? And you can't do this good every week. And then today's a really crappy day, so I'm not doing so good. But based on the presentation that yesterday, we had the VIR, the SPT, and then we had a couple of really good ogres, and it was a pretty good week, about 4,500, 4.5% week per 100K. Now, another lesson we had this week, and this is something that I'd been talking about for months, and I said, hopefully it turns into the mother of all dead money reports, and it's, I guess the daughter of all dead money reports. We had this TKO in AUI gold, and we had a stop down here, and then initial profit target up here. As I often preach, you wanna look for perfection going into a trade. Once you're in the trade, you need to let the chips fall where they may. So I'll stop us down here. What did the stock do? Not a whole lot, all over the place. We were on both sides of profitability and underwater for a long, 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 long time. A lot of people, I'm guessing, exited. Judging from the Facebook post, there were some people that were very aggravated with this stock. What was it Livermore said? Getting mad at a stocks like getting mad at your lungs because you have pneumonia. And you can see we had a nice little rally in there, rallied up, hit the initial profit target, and now we're free rolling. So here's the actual trades. And then you can see got in at 353. I did not get that 420 out of there. I was busy doing some opening gap reversal trading. And that's the downside too. Sometimes you could. It's kind of like the dog with the bone in his mouth and he's looking at the water and he sees a bigger bone in the reflection of the dog in the water so he drops his bone and loses his bone so you have to be really careful if you are going to do some of this more active trading to take care of your own house first i don't know if that was john or peter somebody in the bible said that but it's a good little quote so after all was said and done and usually a lot more is said than done made about 840 on the trade I was looking for a thousand on that loaf and now I have a stop at break even so I'm free rolling and I'm not sure why I don't have this in my other account the one to use the model I don't know if I had that account funded at the time back in last summer or whatever but you'll notice that this came from a different account so I'm not pulling I'm not cherry picking trades I'm gonna try to keep most of the trades out of one single account for anything I'll show you now a little discretion one of the lessons of last week is that a little discretion can go a long ways you just don't want to throw caution to the wind. So what I mean by that is you come in on Monday and the market's getting whacked over the weekend. Well, you know there's a good chance, not it's not a given, but you know that there's a good chance that the market might bounce back. And you know there's a good chance that your positions might improve, especially those which are skirting or have hit the protective stop. So I don't carry stops overnight. I get in the next day and I deal with it. So in this particular case, that, that doesn't always work. Like today I got whacked on one and I gave up more or it cost me more to get out trying to use a little discretion. By the way, this is kind of something that I, I think might be able to, we might be able to use to our advantage. Uh, other charting packages, I haven't seen this, but in, in stock charts, the first day of trading, usually for these IPOs, it just shows you where the stock was scheduled to come public. Now, I don't know if there's a 
some sort of system we could build on this or that adds a piece to the puzzle. But I just wanted to point that out. If you usually I don't capture that first bar on the chart, but if you do see that first bar looks something like that, that's just the opening, or I should say that's just where they priced the IPO. Okay. Has nothing to do with the actual trading of the IPO. Now, in this particular case, what do we have? We had the high set for the week on day one. Okay. So day two, day three, day four, and day five. Pretty obvious example there that the high it was set again for day one after five days of trading. So we know that's the high. So we're looking to get long for a close above that high. Now, in this particular case, you can see we had a new closing high on January 6th. We also had Landry Light. So that's that fulfills everything we need for the trade. We also have decent range on here and a couple other little things we look for in a trade, but it was not above the day one high, and that day one was the high for the first week. Now, again, if day two would have been higher than that, then we don't worry about that. But it seems like a lot of stocks set the high on day one and often die out afterwards. By having that day one high rule, when it's the high for the week, of course, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Now, this particular trade would have worked on that, but I can guarantee you, like the one I showed earlier, Many times it will not. So in this particular case, we had Landry Light. We were at a new closing high right around the close, okay? And that new closing high was above the day one high. I know I'm beating that horse on day one high, but that's an important rule. There's a trade. So we got in 1902, and then we sold half at 21 for two points a couple of days later. Now notice once again with this buy a B pattern, we come in on a, I don't remember what day of the week that was, but we come in and I guess on a Tuesday and then on Wednesday, we're up a little bit. On Thursday, we're up a little bit. And then by Friday, we're actually losing our butt on the trade, but fortunately not stopped out. And then partial profits were taken again for about a two point gain. and then our stop on the remainder was break even. Now, but Dave, it looks like that stop was hit. It was, but that was on Monday when the market was kind of coming unglued, okay? So what I did was I, and I don't carry stop overnight, so I didn't do anything, but I waited to see if it found its low and then figured out where my uncle point would be on the trade. So, so far, so good on that. This is what it looks like intraday. You could see a big move on the open. My stop was actually, I think, a little bit below that level. Yeah, it's right there. There was a stop. So I really didn't throw caution to the wind. It only dropped about 20 cents below. But again, you have to have an uncle point where you're going to get out on that. And that uncle point is where you give it a little bit of wiggle room below the low. Now, sometimes I have the uncle point below the wiggle room. And that's kind of like a hard area where you got to get out, get out no matter what. Uncle means a point of ultimate pain and threshold we have to get out. So looking at the portfolio on the core trend trades, which occasionally have IPOs, but they have to set up within the core methodology. Core methodology being bow ties and TKOs and pullbacks on things of that nature. The core methodology sometimes could catch patterns in IPOs, such as pullbacks and TKOs and all, and, and bow ties for those have been established a little bit more. But the pioneer patterns are kind of breakout in nature and are not part, part of the core methodology. And I will occasionally bring those up in the Facebook group, and some of you guys have too, so thank you for that. So we're free rolling on these positions, and hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully be with them for a long, long time. KOD's not having such a great day today, but you can see when I took the snapshot, you were up about 115%. These are the ones that we have been waiting for, or at least that one is the one, one of the ones we've been waiting for in there. Now, in this particular case, it's kind of interesting because there's quite a few trades on, and that adds up to those profits at the bottom, including some of the swing trades that have been taken. So AUI, for instance, $1,000, TSEO, $1,000, PAGS, $1,000 or 1%, PLMR, $1,000 or 1%, KOD and PING, both 1%, okay? And then you have the remainder on. And you can see that that KOD is helping out the portfolio quite a bit, but even without it, it would be doing pretty good. So that's a bit of a, an aberration. I'd rather have a huge, huge winner than the overall portfolio doing great. And what am I trying to say there? Well, I'd like to make more money, even more money by having some huge winners like that 
I'd like to see that KOD be like 10 grand and a couple other ones in here, 10 grand. So the, the accuracy is not as important, although we have been fairly accurate lately, okay? Especially in the core methodology, accuracy is not as important as making money. I'm trying to think who I could see the guy's face. I'm trying to think of his name. Might be Eckert. William Eckert said that that's one of the the percent correct is one of the least important statistics, and it might actually be negative or have a negative impact overall on a portfolio. And I think he went on to say, what feels good. Short term is not what works longer term in the markets. And a lot of that reversion to the mean trading, can you can do a lot of that. Pure reversion to the mean with no stops. You'll do really well until you don't, as they often joke. So after yesterday's presentation with Stock Charts TV, somebody said, if you hit your initial profit target, is it okay to hold off on moving the stop to break even? And of course, the answer is yes. You can do whatever you want, provided that it's conceptually correct, you understand what you're doing, and then you accept the consequences, both good and bad. So if we go back about a year, we take a look at my GSX trade. This was another one of those cool IPO pioneer patterns where my entry was at a new closing high. And because the high for the first week of trading was set on day one, it also had to be above that high. And it was a pretty little trade. We also had Landry Light in this particular case, which fulfilled the Landry Light five-day SMA, which I need to work on the name on that. Something got to make sure my name's in there for sure. Like my, my wife says, why can't you be like Bollinger? Put your name on something. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't think about it. Didn't really think about it. Anyway, so that's what it looked like. You can see there's a stop on that. And this is how it played out. And again, there's the trade. And I'm, I'm moving to a different account, which I'm going to use more for the model. But you can see that I did actually take this trade, okay? And then look how smart I was. I made about $1,300 over about eh, two or three weeks. I'm pretty smart, right? Well, I've been looking at the stock lately. It's been popping up when I look at my 2,000 charts every night. And I see that I was stopped out back around, what is it, 13 and a half or 12 and a half, 13 a share. And now it's way up here. So 1350 was a stop on that. So if we take where I captured the screen. And then if you take where I exited the trade and multiply it by $500, that's $11,865, hypothetical, okay? Plus 1,000 in the swing trade. So I would have made, by sticking with this position, $12,865 versus $1,295. So I would have made 10 times the amount just by sticking with the trade. Okay, so the question was, is it okay not to move your stop to break even? Well, you're going to capture more trends by not moving your stop to break even. Unfortunately, when you lose, which is going to be more often than not, these big winners don't come along every day, you're going to lose more money. Now, it's just open profits. We can make the argument that Richard Dennis often makes that, well, open profits not as much of a big deal as open losses when you should have gotten out of the trade. So the point is, there's always a trade-off. So again, many times I'll get knocked out of a trade and then should say notice a year or three later that it's since done quite well. So getting, getting back to along the lines of what this gentleman, I'm guessing, was saying, if you take a look at VIR, the entry was here, 500 was sold there, and 500 was sold there, okay? And overall, I think I made a couple of K on this thing, but then you could see that it had traded nicely higher since. Oh, there it is. So 22.66 versus question mark. If this thing runs 50 points tomorrow, then... I'm going to be kind of bummed out. If it implodes tomorrow, then at least I have 2266. So it's always a trade off. Stewart says, I moved my stop to break even and got stopped out today. At least I made about 11% on initial target on GSX. All right, good for you, Stuart. Well, longer term, we hope, and I hate to use the word hope, but we hope to be in some of these for a long, long time and not get shaken out. So there's always a trade off in trading. Just, just wrap your head around what you're doing. 
make sure, make sure, make sure no matter what you do, you're trading for potential or potentially unlimited gains. And then you have limited, or maybe I should say somewhat limited because the risk always kind of gets away from you a little bit, not always, but sometimes can, but have somewhat limited risk. And that's the way you win longer term. Not all day, not every day. You will have bad days like today. It's one thing I can promise. It's funny, this morning, I was thinking a lot about Linda and her book, and one thing she wrote was, just when you think you find the key, they change the lock. And I've been feeling a little bit, and usually whenever I feel superhuman, a few days later, or smug, <laughs> or even just a tiny bit smug, a few days later, the market knocks the smug out of me, right? But just when you think you find the key, they change the lock. And that is so true. You really feel like you have something special and you're printing money. And then, of course, they change the lock on you. So, again, as I said earlier, there's always a, a, a trade off in trading. And the taking of partial profits and the bumping the stock to break even, as opposed to giving a little bit more room, the trade off there is in one case, you're putting the real money in your pocket. Okay. Like I have $2,200 or $2,300 in that model account of real money from the VIR trade. Okay. But let me take a look at my screens. It's up another two points today. I got out around what, what was it? Uh, I forget exactly where I got out, but I think it's like five points higher. So if I'd have just hung with it, I'd be up about another $5,000 now. Okay. So it's always a trade off in trading. Longer term through fairly loose stops. And then ideally, it hits that initial profit target. You go to break even. You're able to, to survive the next correction afterwards, okay? And then it takes off, and then you slowly allow that stop to widen out to the longer-term trade. That's where the real money is, and that's where something like the GSX can work out really nicely longer term. Now, one thing that I was thinking about this morning, because I'm less wealthy today, especially after a big run-up that I had recently, and this is something we talked about last week and weeks prior, is a lot of time as a trend follower, a lot of your time, you're going to spend being less wealthy. You're either giving up open profits or you're having some outright losses. And then it seems like it's only occasionally you knock it out of the park, make a, make a whole lot of money. In some cases, you are fortunate where you have a lot of open positions that you're just giving up open profits. But but you're still being less wealthy, okay? Even though you've taken some profits on some of those. The negative downside, as I often talk about when it comes to trading psychology, and more importantly, trading neurology, and that's going to be more and more of my focus or an additional focus in addition to trading psychology. You guys know I talk a lot about trading psychology and I'm reading some books on neurology now. I know you're probably thinking you want to party with me. I actually have a really good one now that's, that's pretty good in plain English. And I'll talk about that soon. I'll write a now column soon. I'll talk about it. I want to finish the book first, but it's really good. But we have a neurology in us and we all have a shared neurology to where a negative experience has twice the emotional impact as a positive experience, okay? As I've said before, sometimes I'll have a good day. I'll have 10 stocks in my portfolio. Nine of them went a little higher or a lot higher. And I've got one stinker in there. I did really bad on the day. And overall, I had a good day, but I'm find myself focused and pissed off at that one little stinker. Well, the neurology is that that twice a negative emotion, it takes a lot of positive to make up for that. And that's why you have what's called gambler's ruin. The gambler goes out, makes a little money, feels pretty good, loses some money, feels really, really bad. And then if he does that often enough, he ends up chasing that high. And then longer term, he ends up in a downward spiral. So you just have to kind of let the chips fall where they may. You have to realize that a trend follower, you can spend a lot of time being, being less wealthy. But, you know, if you think about it, that's okay. Let's say you sell options and you trade reverse to the mean, and Monday you make money, Tuesday you make money, Wednesday you make money, Thursday you make money. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay, Friday, that decay is working for you. Reverse to mean it's working swimmingly. And you do that for a few weeks or even a few months. And I've actually seen things, two drink minimum story, but I've actually seen things work for like 20 years doing that. I know, it's crazy but then in really, really bad and lives get ruined. So, and again, that's two drink minimum, but you feel good for a long time. And then all of a sudden you're completely out of business. 
And that comes back to, I think William Eckerd, what feels good over the short term does not work longer term and can actually have disastrous, disastrous, is that a word? <laughs> Results, I guess it is now. Who is it, Jesse Jackson will make up his own words? That was great. <laughs> So be careful that negative spiral, all the things I preach, watch that you don't get drawn into the flickering ticks, which I think is a David Keller saying, and don't be like the moth to the flame. Try not to watch the screen too much. I know, try not to think about elephants, right? But do as I say, not as I do sometimes. Discretion can help, kept me in that SPT trade, good, bad, or indifferent, we'll find out soon. Just don't throw caution to the wind. And my one thing that I've been talking a lot about lately is follow the process, follow the process, and follow the process. Get in here, put a protective stop here, takes your initial profits half here, move that stop up to break even if that's if you're following along with the way I do things. Once you get that break even, and then you're free rolling, and here comes the word hope. But hopefully, you will be in that trade for a long, long, long time and capture the mother of all moves. I've heard some scale out in thirds. Is there a management technique to end up with basically a free position running? Travis. Okay, it all comes back to, and trading was always a trade-off. On KOD, what I did was I sold down to the sleeping level because you get into a stock, and then you come in, and the stock has doubled overnight, essentially. That's a lot of money on the line. It's okay to sell down to sleeping level. One thing I have kind of thought about over the years, never really put it into practice, but if you guys, I mean, there's so many thoughts in my head, it'd be great to just research these out and figure it all out. But let's say that you're in something like the VIR trade and you make enough money in the trade to where you could actually own 100 shares of it outright because the trade paid for itself. And especially in these IPOs, I've toured around with, with doing a lot of research. I just don't have time to follow up on it. But let's say you get an IPO, it doubles. Well, you could sell half and then that position has paid for itself. And then you, wouldn't, you could hold on to it, God forbid, without a stop. Okay. And those would be free shares. And on the occasional TLRY, or KOD, or what's some other uh, good IPOs, BYND, things like that, on those occasional rare occasions, yes, you would make a lot of money. Would it be worth it? I, I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. So I hear you on that. I'm not a big fan of scaling out on a general position other than half and then holding on the half, okay? Half seems to be plenty enough if you're right big, Clean enough if you're right small and get stopped out, okay? I would. I think if you're doing thirds, I think it's a little bit too much. But again, it all depends on what you're doing and have you wrapped your head around that and understand the good and the bad about it, okay? So using a little discretion, the good and the bad, like today I came in, got whacked overnight, use a little discretion, I ended up losing more money on the trade, okay? And I don't know if it's turned around or not. No, it hasn't. So I, that actually was, I lost more money than I intended, but that's okay. It, it didn't turn around. If I catch one or two that turn right back around, kind of an opening gap reversal type of thing, but it's damage control, then that's going to make it all worthwhile. So you have to be willing to give up a little bit more, but I'm willing to accept that. And yeah, it pisses me off. And yeah, there's a psychological thing of getting stopped out at the exact low and then watch a damn thing turn around without you. So you just have to wrap your head around all these different things that could happen and expect that sooner or later they will, okay? But yeah, if that makes sense to you and you think that it works for you, then by all means do it. We could certainly, and, and, and you're in the Facebook group, or you should be at least, uh, just make sure you sign up. We could certainly pick it apart if you want in the group. And the great thing is some of you guys are doing some research in the group and sharing it. And for that, I thank you. So. But yeah, bring it up there. Let's uh, noodle with a little bit. But for me, I just keep coming back to half and half. Take half of that swing trade profit. Try to get 1% at least on it or thereabouts, okay? And then stop to break even and then let the stop widen out on the remainder. All the things that I preach in the money management module. Let's take a look at the portfolio real quick since we have, it, uh, since we have a minute. Let's see how things are shaking out. I'll try not to drop an F-bomb. 
contractors next door were like, hey, man, can you watch the language? <laughs> Did I say that already today? I, I thought it at least. AUI, again, this is one we've been in forever. Down a little bit today, but at least it's hovering around its prior highs. This is one where uh, I'm kind of in set it and forget it mode. I don't look at it much anymore because I have a stop and we'll let the chips fall where they may. Q getting hit a little bit in here. As you can see, bouncing around quite a bit. Took off out of this pullback, looked pretty good. Unfortunately, so far, not working out. Swimmingly, BRBR. Eh, Flatsville there, just kind of hanging in there. This was, as you can see, nice little trend higher, a little pullback, okay? PLMR, kind of hanging in there. We had the pullback here, double top knockout, kind of rallying out of that. This was the original trade, I think, back here. So far, so good. PGNY coming in a little bit today. Longer terms, looks like it's in a pretty decent uptrend. Ping, a little bit of a rally, trying to rally out of this pullback, KOD. This one, I'm kind of impressed that it's hung in there. I mean, it took off obviously doubling plus overnight. It's pulled back a little bit, but it's not coming unglued. I know it sucks when you come in and you're down two and a half points or more. PSCO. Looks like it started off kind of weak today, kind of rallying up a little bit, still down percentage change. Keep in mind that this is a short. And then finally, PAGS, another short, as you can see, down a little bit in here. This was like from way back here. If you go back in, I think it was a stock chart show. It might have been a week of charts too, where I talked about the first thrust back here and how it was dead money back here. And I could all but guarantee that most people gave up on that. Not that every trade works out. I mean, if it did, you'd never see my fat ass again, right? But more often than not, following the process longer term is the thing to do. But the market, here it comes, being a bad teacher, will often tempt you not to follow the process. Let's take a look at the overall market, and then we'll drill down. You guys want to start asking about individual trades, do so now, or you can begin to do so, I should say. All right, let's take a look at the P's. That's a P500. Gapping lower today, no follow through. I look to play, what did I look to play? Tex, I think, and it failed miserably. So, you know, first guru in history to show you a, uh, was it Tex or what was it? TNA, it was, I think it was TNA. Gotta watch what I say. In this day and age, I can't say I like TNA. Well, I certainly don't like TNA today. But you can see gapped lower, nice little reversal, but they came right back in, stopped me out. It happens, pronounced with a solid SH. Getting back to the P's. So we had a little bit of an opening gap here. Let's take a look at the spiders, get a little bit better open on that. So spiders gap down, tried to rally. That's what sucked me into that opening gap reversal. Okay, see, it doesn't always work. All right. I guess if it did, we'd all be, there wouldn't be a market, right? But you can see, rallied up a little bit, came back in, not the end of the world, okay? But we do have a little volatility coming into the market. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart and let's go to the P's, cash, and a three-day chart and a four-day chart. So it's not the end of the world. When you look at like a weekly chart, just to gain a little bit more perspective, so far it just looks like a trend knockout, okay? And it's funny, somebody in the group said a few days ago, like last week before, uh, <laughs> I think it was on this day here, they asked if I was going to get shirts printed to say I survived the correction of 2020. Well, usually when you start feeling like that or when you see me acting like God, you know it's coming, right? But you can see market a little questionable in here, but certainly still looks pretty good longer term. I think that's the, the main point I'm trying to make. Let me see if I could throw a bow tie in here. Sometimes these hot keys screw up. There we go. So Remember, as I say, if you have a close below an exponential moving average, if you watch Trading Full Circle, and I think underneath the methodology in the members area, I talk a lot about this. I learned that from Greg Morris. With uh, the simple moving average, you might have several closes below, and the lag takes a while to keep to catch up, okay? But with an exponential moving average, as soon as you close below, it will turn down, okay? So we have a close. If we closed here today, you can see that the 20 is turned down, has turned down, and the 30 has turned down. Now, if this closes above it, it will turn, the 30 at least will turn right back up. The 20 will stay down as long as we are below the 20, okay? 
So we could be in the early phases of a bow tie. I think Jim, I want to say Freeman in the Facebook group. Yeah, it's Jim. He does a lot of short-term work in the markets, which I think is pretty cool. And he, I think he pointed out recently we had a bow tie down. Yeah, so we had a bow tie down here, a little bit of a, th a throwback type of retrace. And so far, we've imploded from that. Let's take a look at the hourly chart. Good work, by the way, Jim. Keep uh, sharing your uh, research with us. Thank you. On an hourly basis, yeah, hourly bow tie down. But then unfortunately, if you were trying to trade that hourly, that's the problem with day over day short term trading, which I would pure short term trading, which I would caution you against. It's like you get the signal, but then the next day, all of your moves in that one big day and you wouldn't have gotten in. But we do have the bow ties turned down on the hourly. OK, and remember, the market will turn on the hourly before it turns on the daily first. OK, and that's just fractal nature of patterns. But the daily so far, let's not freak out or anything in here, but let's do honor our stops just in case. NASDAQ 100 or NASDAQ composite, I should say, correction. Close, if it closed right now, it'd be below the 20-day simple moving average, I'm sorry, exponential moving average and below the 20, below the 10. Let me just rewind all that. Whoop. If we close where we are now, we would be below the 20-day exponential moving average and that moving average would turn down. Hard to see probably on your screen, but on my screen, I could see it fairly clearly. And notice that the 30 exponential moving average is still headed higher, and that's because so far the close is above it. The 10 has begun to catch up, and you can see it's beginning to roll over a little bit. Again, not the end of the world. Now, what's what's got me a little bit concerned is as we go through these sectors, there are some like energies not doing so hot in here let's take a look at like drugs you could see drugs look okay longer term but over the short term you have a bit of a micro first thrust lower and you can see today we're getting whacked out of that pretty good for about one percent let's take a look at the bow ties and we don't quite have a crossing yet remember there sometimes there's lag in the in the moving averages when you have a rollover so don't go purely off of that but if we do get a, a bow tie down here and in other places we might want to begin to pay attention retail is another one of those areas you can see has lost steam and if we close down here we would be below all three moving averages the 10-day moving average the simple has caught up okay so now it's headed lower the 20s headed lower the 30s headed lower so i would urge you when you go out and do your sector research go out there and take a look at these bow tie moving averages okay now let's take a look at a few other areas gold getting a little bit of a bid in here where are the peas let's see peas are down about a half a percent round numbers and gold is up a little bit it's good to see gold getting a bid when the market's selling off and it's also usually let's just take a quick peek at bonds TLT is what I use in my proxy there. It's good to see bonds rallying a little bit because that tells me it's not a complete liquidation market. People may be running away from stocks, but they're also running to some safety. When you come in and bonds are down and gold's down and the market's down and it keeps in all three are dropping, that's when it gets a little bit scary. That's known as throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Before I forget, Russell 2000, the Rusty, not looking so good. This thing has been lagging forever compared to the P's and the NASDAQ. Not the end of the world, but obviously if we get all the way back into this prior little breakout, I would be concerned if we don't recover from today's sell-off, I would begin to get a little concerned here. You could see we could get a bow tie down, not from all-time highs, but close enough to be concerning. This was the last time we had it from all-time highs. You could see what happened it got pretty ugly will it get that ugly this time i don't know but we need to pay attention okay let's take a look at gold the stocks okay donald uh, that's one that's on the service as a potential setup so we're not going to look at that today but uh, good eye on that if you want to pm me we can certainly look at that later Gold stocks are looking okay in here, as you can see, not too far from these multi, 
year highs. Let's get back to AUY, which we are long. AUY obviously didn't get the memo just yet. We're still slightly in the negative on the day. Banks, you can see, have rolled over in here. Now, a few days ago, I certainly was a lot more constructive towards the market than I am now. And I'm, I'm not, I don't want to label myself. I'm certainly not bearish yet, though, if we want to, my, my Cajun, just the people's like, you don't sound Cajun. You live in New York for a while? It's like, no, I visit New York, New York, or used to once or twice a year in business. But I, I'm pretty Cajun, believe me. <laughs> the banks look bad, man. Look at this stock. They're not doing good at all. But you can see banks bow tied down, banging out new multi-month lows. So that's not a pretty chart. Biotech, getting back to the drugs. Biotech looks a little bit more questionable than drugs overall. You can see getting whacked fairly hard in here, down a percent and change. It's kind of interesting. I don't know what they're blaming the sell-off on. I think it's on that coronavirus. But they always try to blame it on something. And, and believe me, you can't connect the dots. I mean, the coronavirus, well, I'm trying to think. There's been so many bad news events and the market has just climbed that wall of worry and the market will climb the wall of worry until it doesn't. And right now it's not, okay? But biotech looking pretty dubious in here. If we do close down here towards the lows, I would begin to get concerned as you can see, getting that bow tie down off our all time highs, which is not, a good thing, as you would imagine. And then it's kind of mixed throughout. Some areas like Leisure have gotten whacked in here recently, beginning to implode a little bit. Some areas like computer hardware, or as some people call it, Apple. Let's just take a look at Apple. Still doing okay, longer term, okay? And let's take a look at software. Software still kind of hanging in there, okay? Hardware, you got hardware, you need software for your hardware, right? Semiconductors, certainly not the end of the world here, just kind of pulling back, okay? But do pay attention, all right? We have lost a little steam. Notice we kind of took off straight up in here. We lost some steam, much, much, much longer terms. Take a look like a weekly, no big deal, just a little corrective action. But yeah, it's beginning to come unglued a little bit on the daily chart, okay? Bow ties have all turned down. Well, no big shocker there. We're closing below, right? And then based on the action, the 10 has begun to work its way to catch up and, of course, has turned down. So kind of mixed out there. A few areas still doing really well. A few areas looking dubious. Utilities, bang on new highs. Kind of hard to get excited about utilities, though. So what do we do in a case like this? Well, on your stops on existing positions and I just showed you, well, sometimes you don't take those partial profits and you catch a huge trade. Well, I would recommend that you always take those partial profits, get that stop bumped up. That's just the way I do it, okay? Sometimes I regret it, but more often than not, because a lot of times you don't get follow through, that's the way to trade, okay? So make sure you're taking those partial profits, trailing those stops, et cetera. Bought Goog a few days ago on a pullback. Did it look reasonable? All right. Stewart is brave. Uh, well, I don't like to trade stocks when they make a gap against the trend. Now, I know the overall market gapped against the trend. I think you could certainly do much worse, okay? Because at least, at least you're trading in the direction of the trend, right? But I would have not taken this trade. The other reason I would not have taken this trade HV is 15, and the volume obviously is pretty big on that at a couple of zeros. Was that 15 million, 13 million on average? So just make sure you have a plan in place, a stop in case you were wrong on that one. It's kind of hanging in there considering the overall market, but I tend to avoid stocks. And I know you're new to the members area, but go through all the methodology when you get a chance. I tend to avoid stocks that have a gap against the trend, with especially within the setup. Okay, that's one of my, this morning I was saying, there's no hard and fast rules. Well, this is kind of a hard and fast rule. So I'm talking on the both sides of my mouth there. Talking on the both sides of my mouth. Um, so I would have avoided it in perfect hindsight and I would have avoided it altogether. The other thing too is, 
a big thick stock like this is not going to provide you with a tremendous amount of opportunity. I know in some cases it's like Apple just goes up day after day. I hear you. But as a general statement, these stocks tend to be priced a little bit more for perfection, a lot of analysts on them and all. Now, there could be a possible edge in opening gap reversals when you're in serious, serious trends on stocks like these. And that's something I haven't fleshed out fully, but something that we, we've been talking about a little bit in the Facebook group on that. Okay, NSW shorted on a pullback. It's amazing. A lot of you guys are really anxious to get short. What I, first of all, your average volume is only 300,000 shares. Okay. As a general statement, I won't short anything that has less than a half a million shares on average. And the reason being is let's say a big trader comes in and buys the heck out of this stock or whatever, and there's a bunch of people short. You could have the mother of all squeezed and get screwed really bad, really fast. It's also harder to borrow, obviously, when the volume's kind of low like this. Now, I know, I think uh, you and I were talking offline or in the group. I do like stocks that are coming off a higher level. So you're correct. This is coming off a of higher levels. The thing that I noticed here, since we backed the chart out, is you have a ton of support here. So if you short coming into this range, there's a pretty good chance it's going to find some support into that range. You would be much better off finding a big cap stock at high levels and looking to go short there. Just for S and Gs, let's take a look at like components for the Dow. I'm trying to think of a way to get some big, thick stocks in here. Component, there we go. Thank you, Donald. High five to Donald for that. Let's take a look at like the Dow stocks. Okay, let's throw in the moving averages. So if I were to short something, I'd much rather prefer, I'd much prefer to short something big and fat like this. Something that's priced for perfection, meaning that all the analysts think that they've crunched all the numbers and think that it should be trading here or whatever, and it should go up another 30% over the next three months and blah, blah, blah. And then they come out and fall short of that. And then some bad news begins to come out and everybody's expecting so much more and that doesn't happen. So the point I'm trying to make here and the reason I'm going through these is I would much rather find something at high levels. Boeing's all over the place. I don't know one of you guys caught a nice little move here. Congratulations. But I'd much rather find something at high levels just beginning to break down like Boeing did a while back, although I would not have taken that trade. Cisco's a good example. It's a little wide and loose, but your trade, your big opportunity is shorting something big cap as a general statement at high levels, okay? It's sort of just the opposite of what we do with the trend trades on the upside. On the upside, we might be trading some hot little biotech on the downside see like jp morgan and i should never i got to be careful saying this hopefully my wife's not watching but put a gun to my head because obviously some ups and downs in this business but put a gun to my head if i had to make a big cap trade short i would short jp morgan jpm okay out of that particular list obviously it wouldn't go after coke because it's going up mcdonald's so far going up let's see anything else See, I'd much rather, instead of down here at low levels, find something at high levels like it was back here in 3M. Merck, this is a little kind of wide and loose, but this is what you want to look for. Look at that bow tie down, nice little pullback. It's got all this support, okay? But forget about all this for a second. This is what you want to look like, look at for a short. This is almost textbook in nature. That's beautiful. But again, too much support below the market. Nike beginning to break down, that could turn into a pretty cool setup. This is a reversal gap strategy. Gap followed by pullback, followed by sell-off. And let's see what else is in here. UNH, this could be another one soon. You see beginning to break down in here, okay? But I'm not ready to go short crazy just yet. But I wanna show you, in case I get hit by a beer truck, okay? <laughs> what I will be looking for when it comes time to short. Now, if something just jumps out at me, I might fire off a short. I'm not saying I won't short right now, but I'm letting things kind of come apart a little bit more. All right, good, I've reached Chris. He agrees with me on the support, good. 
How about for Mr. Mike SWKS coming up higher levels? Beautiful, absolutely. Okay, let's look at the volume. You got an S ton of volume, plenty of volume. Okay, semiconductors. We'll take a look at the semis in one second. Semis are still doing pretty good, but here's the deal. If you are to short something as a transitional setup, sometimes it's not the two out of three ain't bad meatloaf trade where you got the sector and the stock rolling over. Sometimes you have to be willing to go in as a standalone setup. So yeah, on a little bit of a bounce, this might be worth shorting. Okay, let's take a look at the semiconductors overall i think we looked at them a minute ago but let's take a look at them yeah keep the stock picks coming we have time for about two maybe three more let's take a look at the semis talk amongst yourselves electronics there you go yeah so swks kind of looks like the overall sector so semis overall looking kind of ugly for the aggressive maybe if we have a big old fat gap tomorrow something like soxl could be worth a shot by the way i don't hold the i don't hold any leverage funds overnight but let's just see what the soxs is doing just for s and g's you could see the soxs which is the inverted semiconductors is beginning to bottom out okay but right now i think the play could be a big opening gap reversal in the soxl okay if should that occur you come in tomorrow, futures are down 50 points, 60 points. I don't know what the, anybody know what the circuit breakers are now? But whatever it is, not limit down, but just hard, come in hard tomorrow. Then maybe, just maybe SOXL might be worthwhile as a trade. But yeah, Mike, yeah, keep that on your radar for sure. It kind of looks like the rest of the semis. It's kind of a proxy for the overall sector, but absolutely. TXG, yeah, this is one that I've been watching for quite a while. It's crazy, but it's pretty cool. It was a Dakota was talking about this one in the group. So good eye to all of you guys. Uh, it has kind of worked its way higher. It's kind of taken off. And now it's in a bit of a knockout move. Okay, I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout, believe it or not. It's kind of wild and crazy though. HV up here around 80 bucks a share. But I can't argue with it too much. I mean, I don't like these super wide range bars back here, but you could certainly do much worse. You've got some persistency, some crazy acceleration. And you've got a bit of a knockout. You could use a little bit more. Volume isn't huge, but it's enough on a $100 stock to trade it at 300,000 shares on average. So yeah, good eye on that one, Donald. Okay, I think we are officially, we're, I have time for one more. Anyone want to try to squeeze one in? We're almost out of time. While we're in the pass, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, davelander.com slash contact and of course if you're in the facebook group just bring it up there or submit it officially through the questions on the members area if you want me to spend some time and uh, do a little bit more detailed type of presentation put some slides together be happy to do that if we don't talk to you now and then everybody have a fantastic weekend thanks again guys and girls for attending today thank you so much